when we leave here today, I want everyone to carry on Shadi's light in you and treat everyone the way that she treated all of us. We love you. We love you. This son of a is gonna pay. This is justice for Shade. What a would do something like this to my beautiful baby? She hurt nobody. To lose a child is something that was not a part of my plan. But my daughter's voice is actually reaching and touching and making awareness of what really exists. This is 19-year-old Sade Robinson. On April 1st, 2023, she was really excited to go on her first date with a man she had recently met. Unfortunately, she didn't know that would be the beginning of a horrific nightmare for her and her family. Her loved ones started to panic when they couldn't reach her on the phone that evening, and she didn't show up at work. The next April 2nd, 2024, that same day, one of her co-workers reported her missing. But unfortunately, that missing person's report would quickly escalate into a potential homicide when her car was found on fire in an alleyway approximately two miles away from where she was last seen with her date, 33-year-old Maxwell Anderson. In the following days, body parts started showing up at different locations in Milwaukee. Unfortunately, those body parts came back as a positive match for Sade Robinson. This was a girl with her life still ahead of her. She was set to graduate with an associate degree in criminal justice from MATC in just one month and turn 20 the next month. Sadly, one deranged monster didn't allow her to live those dreams. Who did this to Sade Robinson? What did she do to deserve this level of savagery? Does this have anything to do with the guy she went on that date with? And will her family ever get justice for her? Sade Carlina Robinson was born in Vicksburg, Mississippi on May 10, 2004. When she was born, her parents, Sheena Scarborough and Carlos Robinson, were overjoyed with the arrival of their first child, but it wasn't long before they gave her a younger sister, Adriana, making them a lovely family of four. The family, at first glance, appeared to have a picture-perfect life. However, life took an unexpected turn when Sade was just two years old. Her parents, Sheena and Carlos, started having problems and their relationship slowly fell apart. Sadly, they eventually decided to go their separate ways. Seeking a fresh start, Sheena moved with Sade to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, while Carlos eventually settled in Florida. This split meant that Sade's life would now be divided between two states. Growing up, Sade adapted to the challenging situation. She spent her time traveling back and forth between Milwaukee and Florida, trying to spend as much time as possible with both of her parents. It wasn't easy, but Sade was a resilient and adaptable child. She learned to find joy in both places and made the best of her circumstances. Sade had attended one of the public schools within the Milwaukee area where she enjoyed girls scout and soccer. According to her mother Scarborough, Sade was an art lover. She was a talented dancer who found joy in rapping, performing, and even dabbled in ballroom dance. In middle school, Sade was part of the Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps, or JROTC. Her mother said she had actually dreamed of one day joining the U.S. Air Force to serve her country. As Sade entered her teenage years, she attended Ida S. Baker High School in Florida. Sade was an excellent student, and her good grades were proof of how hard she really worked. While in high school, Sade began looking for job opportunities as she was eager to start building her career and gain some independence. Even though her parents were ever supportive and took care of her, Sad didn't want to depend on anyone. She has always wanted to make her own money right from an early age. Nancy, everything you spoke was exactly what my daughter exerted. I couldn't have asked for any better daughter. This girl was a hustler, but her go-getter spirit did not distract her from her studies as she graduated a semester early from Riverside in December 2021. So, instead of her set, she walked the graduation stage with the class of 2022. After high school, Sade enrolled at MATC to pursue a degree in criminal justice and was considering continuing her studies at Concordia University in Mequon. There was things my daughter did that many adults were not even able to accomplish in their lifetime. While she was working hard to achieve her goals, Saad also looked out for her baby sister, Adriana. She helped Adriana get a job at the Wisconsin Club where she also worked as a hostess. Sade herself had been working there for a while, 
balancing her schoolwork and job responsibilities with ease. In addition to her job at the Wisconsin Club, Sade worked at a restaurant called Pizza Shuttle. She had been working there for about five years and was well known for her cheerful personality and strong work ethic. Shade is beautiful, beautiful soul. I knew that my kids were very special and different. They were, were, my parents raised me, they raised us. She worked mainly at the front counter as a cashier, and her manager, Justin Romano, said she was a favorite among co-workers and customers, often talking with her all day. Despite her busy schedule, Sade managed to balance everything perfectly. She was a full-time college student and held down two jobs, all at the young age of 19. Her hard work allowed her to afford a small, cozy apartment in Milwaukee. She often had her grandmother, Linda, over for visits. They spent quality time together, cooking seafood and making beautiful memories. She doesn't stay in a college dorm campus. She has her own bachelorette department. She has her own car. She pays all of her own bills. This is traumatizing, Nancy. I never expected this to pull up on my front door. Sade's future looked incredibly bright. She was set to graduate with an associate degree in criminal justice from MATC with a commendable 3.5 GPA in just one month and turn 20 the next month. A month before she's graduating with her associate of arts degree. She works so hard. She's a full-time student. She has two full-time jobs. She has her own little bachelorette apartment. However, that milestone moment for her family won't happen as she mysteriously disappeared on April 2nd, 2024, leaving her loved ones in a state of shock and heartbreak. We need to do whatever we can to bring her home. Until we find out what we need to find out, we just come out and, and you just keep pushing forward. And we let the experts come and decide, you know, determine what they know. And, and we're just the eyes and the ears on the ground. She was bright. Always, you know, making fellow people welcomed. She looked out for my baby. The least I could do was look out for her, her mama's baby. According to Sade's family, the last time they saw her was on March 31st, 2024. That day was Easter Sunday, and Sade spent the entire day with her family at her grandparents' home, where her mother was staying at the time. It was a fun-filled day for the entire Robinson family as they ate and dined together in the comforting presence of loved ones. Nancy, the last time I spoke to my daughter was on Easter Sunday, okay? We seen her, she came by my parents' home. We spent the Sunday together. This was Easter Sunday, okay? Um, I cooked for them. Both of my daughters, we all met by my parents' house where I'm currently at. Sade was particularly excited that day because she was going on a first date with a man she'd recently met, a 33-year-old bartender named Maxwell Anderson. Her family could see the excitement in her eyes and wished her well on this new adventure because they knew she deserved all the love in the world. So, after spending time with her family that day, she left in the evening for her apartment because she needed to be at work early the following day. When Sade got to work the following day, April 1st, she was buzzing with excitement as she told her co-workers about her date with Maxwell that evening. She was also on the phone texting Maxwell to finalize their plans for the day. She asked Maxwell, where are we meeting? I can do five. Hmm, downtown somewhere? Maxwell realized. Shade said, okay. Maxwell then said, Brat House on 3rd? Shade responded by saying, Perfect. Maxwell told her, Okay, I'm going to shower quickly. I'll probably get there more around 5.15. He then asked her, Are you hungry? I need to stop at Twisted Fisherman to pick up my W-2 from last year, and we could eat there first. Sade replied, Okay, and yes. She then asked, Are we eating at the Brat House or the other place? Maxwell replied by saying, Let's eat at Twisted. I'm feeling seafood. Yes. I love seafood, Sade said. Maxwell then said, Sounds good. I'm about to leave. I'll be there soon. Sade left work earlier that day so she could go get ready for the date, and as she got ready, she FaceTimed her mother, seeking advice on her outfit and hairstyle. This is every mother's dream, to see their child happy, and Sade's mother was no different. 
She encouraged her daughter and gave her some tips on how to style her dress and look her best. Later that evening, Said and Maxwell made it to the restaurant, where they ate and drank until around 6.30 p.m. when they left the place. Unfortunately, that would be the last time anyone would see or hear from Said again. The search for her began when she didn't show up at work the next day, April 2nd. Her manager, Justin, noticed her absence immediately, knowing it was out of character for her to miss work without notifying anyone. He said that he couldn't remember a time when she had missed a shift and that there was nothing suspicious about her behavior in the days leading up to her sudden disappearance. Everything was very normal. That, why it was so concerning, when she didn't show, Justin said. Her co-workers, whom she had told about her date the previous day, were worried sick about her. They tried to reach her on the phone severally, but for some strange reason, her phone was not connecting. When hours passed with no word from Saad, one of her friends decided to contact the authorities and report her missing. Officers conducted a welfare check at her apartment, but found no trace of her. This heightened the alarm among her family and friends, who banded together and launched a search party for her. However, this missing person's investigation quickly escalated into a homicide investigation when Sade's 2020 Honda Civic was found on fire in an alleyway approximately two miles away from where she was last seen with Maxwell Anderson. At the time, Sade met Maxwell Anderson. He was working as a bartender at the same restaurant where they had their first date. His record showed that he had mainly worked either as a security guard or bartender for different businesses in the Milwaukee area. It's unclear why he preferred those kinds of jobs instead of getting a permanent job, but it seems that kind of lifestyle allowed him to drift from place to place, never staying long enough at a place to put down roots and familiarize himself with people. His rap sheet is filled with a troubling series of criminal activities. He had faced numerous arrests for drunk driving and court records also suggest there have been concerns about his mental health and substance abuse. A particularly serious incident occurred in July 2014 when Maxwell was charged with misdemeanor disorderly conduct. The charges stemmed from a chaotic encounter that happened when Maxwell was visiting his family from Colorado. One of his relatives returned home from work one day and found Maxwell acting strangely and sweating profusely. The relative tried to find out what was going on with him, but he could not answer any of her questions. Eventually, Maxwell began screaming and throwing things and locked his relative in a room while he tried calling his father on the phone. When a deputy arrived at the scene, Maxwell defiantly challenged them then fled into the garage and stole the woman's car. However, his reckless escape ended when he crashed the vehicle into a deck close by. He also got into a physical confrontation with another relative, which resulted in the relative breaking multiple ribs. Maxwell himself ended up in the hospital with a broken collarbone. One of his relatives told investigators she believed Anderson was under the influence of substances during the time of those attacks. However, Maxwell was still charged with two misdemeanor counts of disorderly conduct. He pleaded guilty to one count in October 2014 and paid a $460 fine. Maxwell's legal troubles continued into the following year. In June 2015, Maxwell had been living in his relative's basement in Egg Harbor for about two months. His relatives were frustrated with his behavior, as he would come and go as he pleased and never helped with cleaning. They tried to discuss house rules with him but Anderson didn't take it well. When one relative suggested he seek help for his mental health, Maxwell became enraged. He threw a glass, punched a hole in the wall, and smashed two cell phones when they tried to call the authorities. With no other phone available, a relative had to run to a neighbor's house to call for help. The damage Maxwell caused amounted to over $1,300. In the aftermath, he faced four misdemeanor charges, and in October 2015, he pleaded guilty to three of them. Criminal damage to property, intimidating a witness, and disorderly conduct involving abuse. As a result, he was put on probation for a year, required to pay fines and restitution, and had to maintain full-time employment or schooling while completing any necessary programs set by the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. However, those disciplinary measures only worked for some time before Maxwell continued with his pattern of violence. In 2019, he got into a street fight with a stranger who tried to intervene during an argument between Maxwell and a woman. A witness captured the violent scene on video, showing Maxwell repeatedly striking the man before dragging him to the ground. Maxwell admitted to the attack when he was arrested by law enforcement and pleaded guilty to misdemeanor disorderly conduct. 
His sentence included one year of probation, 25 hours of community service, and $7,000 in restitution to the victim for medical expenses and lost wages. In January 2022, Maxwell found himself in trouble once again with the West Allis law enforcement when an officer spotted his car hurtling down the road at 70 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour zone, disregarding a flashing red light. When the officer pulled him over, Maxwell explained that he was on his way home from work. However, a breathalyzer test revealed a blood alcohol content of 0.145, and an open container was discovered in his vehicle. Anderson admitted to having been drinking, marking his second drunk driving offense. The first occurred in 2014 in Waukesha County. He pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor, resulting in a year of probation, a $350 fine, and the suspension of his driver's license. But Anderson's troubles didn't end there. In August of the same year, he was cited for driving with a suspended license in Ozaukee County. During a court hearing that month, his probation agent reported that Anderson had tested positive for coke, THC, and alcohol. This prompted a Milwaukee County judge to mandate sobriety as a condition of his probation. Despite these setbacks, by March 2023, Anderson had completed his probation and was discharged. Now, in April 2024, this same Maxwell Anderson found himself in the middle of a homicide investigation because he was the last person to be seen with Sade Robinson hours before her sudden disappearance. Given his extensive criminal history, could it be that Maxwell had anything to do with Sade's disappearance? The day Sade was reported missing marked the beginning of a harrowing ordeal for her family and friends. What made it even worse was that a few hours after she went missing, her 2020 Honda Civic was discovered engulfed in flames in an alleyway about two miles from where she was last seen. Inside the car, investigators found burnt clothes that matched the outfit Sade was seen wearing the previous night, along with a partially burnt iPhone similar to hers. As the search for Sade intensified, the situation became increasingly unbearable for everyone who knew her. Her manager, Justin, even closed the pizza place for three days to join the search efforts, highlighting how much Sade meant to everyone. Yeah, and this memorial has been here for weeks and it's still growing. Co-workers at Pizza Shuttle say that Robinson was a customer favorite and a staple at the restaurant. You can see some of the messages of love and support here. Forever 19, love you always, my beautiful angel. These words and everything in the service today really just showing how important Robinson is to her loved ones and to the community. Her family was plunged into a nightmare confronted with the terrifying possibility that Sade might never come home. But what they didn't know was that the discovery of her burnt car was only the beginning of a series of grim discoveries awaiting them. The situation became more distressing a few days later when a horrifying report came in. A human leg had been found on a beach along Lake Michigan in Kudahi. Unfortunately, DNA testing confirmed that it belonged to Sade. At this point, Sade's family was desperate to find answers. So, her mother and another close friend of hers provided investigators with access to her phone records from a location-sharing app linked to her phone. This crucial information allowed investigators to trace Sade's movements on the night of her disappearance. It showed that she had gone from the Twisted Fisherman Seafood Restaurant to a nearby bar, then to Maxwell's home, and finally to the park where parts of her body were later discovered. On April 4th, Maxwell Anderson was arrested and charged with multiple serious crimes, including first-degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, and arson. Following his arrest, investigators uncovered a wealth of evidence pointing to Maxwell's involvement in Sade's disappearance and possible murder. Surveillance footage, witness statements, and phone records all implicated him in the crime. The investigation revealed that on the night of the incident, Maxwell and Sade were seen on the restaurant's security cameras, sitting and talking for about an hour. After their time at the restaurant, Sade and Maxwell went to a bar where they stayed for about two hours. Data from their phones showed that after the bar, they spent three hours at Maxwell's home. Around 1 a.m., Sade's phone indicated she left Maxwell's house and went to the part where her body was found. Her phone remained in the park until it died around 4 a.m. A surveillance camera outside Maxwell's apartment also showed him driving out with Sade's car early that morning. A significant breakthrough came when a witness reported seeing a white male getting out of Sade's car early on the morning of April 2nd. She observed the man light a fire in the car before getting on a city bus. Guess who the investigators identified as the suspect? 
when they obtained and reviewed the surveillance camera inside the bus. Maxwell Anderson. Armed with this information, they quickly secured a search warrant for Maxwell's apartment. Inside the apartment, investigators found his bed soaked with red bodily fluids, and the stairs leading to his basement also had red stains on them. The basement was described as a dungeon containing items like handcuffs and sling restraints, suggesting that Maxwell had used the space for vile activities with women. However, DNA analysis of the fluids found in Maxwell's home revealed they did not match Sade's DNA. This raised the chilling possibility that Maxwell might have had another unidentified victim. Is it possible that he had taken other women to his house and murdered them without anyone knowing? If the red fluids discovered in his house did not belong to Sade, then whose DNA was that? Now, the question really becomes this morning, do investigators think the blood that doesn't belong to Sade is evidence of a crime against somebody else. Where will that blood lead them? I mean, let's think about it. Who lives in a house with blood on the walls? Now, since Sade's DNA was not found in the house, could there be a possibility that Maxwell murdered her somewhere else, like her car? So they need to find exactly where this event happened, and I'm leaning more towards her vehicle. Just because, I mean, her vehicle's parked at this location for, I think it was three hours and 19 minutes, according to the affidavit. So it, this could have all have occurred inside that car and another reason why it had to be burnt because there was a lot of evidence in that car. So I think that's where investigators will be pulling that thing apart, taking it right down to the metals, whatever is left over and see if they can get any other types of forensics from there. While investigators and Sade's family were still trying to process this whole thing, other body parts were discovered on April 18th. A person walking along a remote beach area near Lake Michigan in South Milwaukee found a human torso and an arm. The medical examiner was able to quickly determine that those parts belonged to Sade. As you would imagine, at this point, Sade's loved ones were once again devastated by this news. How could anyone be this cruel to not just murder this innocent girl, but butcher her remains and scatter them all over the place? Despite their immense grief, they organized a memorial event called Pink Out in front of Maxwell's home, painting it pink, Sade's favorite color, to honor her memory and demand justice. On May 10th, 2024, the day Sade would have turned 20 years old, her family organized a public memorial for her, where they shared their memory of her and remembered her as a remarkable young woman who touched many different parts of the community. I miss you, I miss you, I On what would have been Shade Robinson's 20th birthday. Shade was so special to me. Robinson's family and friends are fighting through grief and pain to honor her and everything the 19-year-old accomplished. From her baby sister, Adriana. Through everything people put her through, she never stopped greeting everyone with the utmost grace and respect. To her mother. She would have been receiving her Associate of Arts degree next week from MATC. And she still will be receiving it. And she still will be receiving it. We will be walking in her place for her. To lose a child is something that was not a part of my plan. But my daughter's voice is actually reaching and touching and making awareness of what really exists. The emotions were very raw for family and friends. A story that resonates, bringing together a community. It was the smile. It was ear to ear. So cute. So happy. Even at this time, her family didn't want her to be remembered for her tragic death, but for the amazing life she lived and the lives she touched. When we leave here today, I want everyone to carry on Shadi's light in you and treat everyone the way that she treated all of us. We love you. We love you. Sade's mother, Sheena, made a heartfelt plea to Maxwell's parents, urging them to convince their son to reveal the location of the rest of Sade's body parts so they could lay her to rest properly. Sheena said his family should have the ability to influence him. If they are in any way, shape, or form decent human beings, they should take steps to convince him to tell the truth. And of course, as we've mentioned before, her friends and family are still out boots on the ground on the shores of Lake Michigan searching for the rest of the 19-year-old's remains. They say they won't be able to come to peace with any of this until she's properly laid to rest. The family's anguish was unimaginable. They were tormented by the discovery of Sade's scattered body parts and the horrifying thought of what she endured 
forward in her final moments. The investigation on this case is still ongoing, with authorities determined to uncover the full extent of Maxwell's crimes and bring closure to Sade's grieving family. Meanwhile, Maxwell has pleaded guilty to the murder charges against him and waived his right to a preliminary hearing. Showing you a document that's called preliminary hearing, questionnaire, and waiver. Is that your signature near the bottom of this page? Yes, Your Honor. Did you read this document or did your attorney read it to you or both? Both, Your Honor. And did you understand it? Yes, Your Honor, sir. Did you understand that if you had a hearing, the state would have to produce witnesses and perhaps other evidence to show that you probably committed a felony? Yes, Your Honor. Did you also understand that by waiving that hearing, you are conceding that the state can establish probable cause and you will be ordered to stand trial? Yes, Your Honor. Anyone make any threats to get you to give up your hearing? No, Your Honor. Anyone make any promises to get you to give up your hearing? No, Your Honor. I will find that Mr. Anderson has made a knowing, intelligent, and voluntary waiver of his right to have a hearing in order him bound over for trial. As of now, he remains in jail, held on a $5 million bond. In a surprising turn of events, Maxwell's family has recently sold his house, the one connected to Sade Robinson's murder. Now, the new owner allegedly had no idea the property involved such a high-profile homicide case. Anyway, the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office has maintained that the home sale would not impact the criminal investigation against Maxwell Anderson. Do you think Maxwell's family is trying to cover up something for him by selling his house while he's still in the middle of a homicide investigation? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay safe.